My name's John Cook. I'm the co-chair of the conference with Sujata Mitra. Uh, I'd like to welcome you for the second time we all get together. Uh, tomorrow we get together for another um, uh, keynote. But later on we, we, we get the keynote, second keynote in the series uh, from uh, Karen Cater, who's coming in abroad from the USA and um, because she had to have some meetings at the White House and things like that. Um, maybe. Uh, We'll hear more about that in a minute. Karen, my apologies, uh, is the Director of the Office of Educational Technology at the US Department of Education, and previously uh, Head of Apple's leadership and advocacy efforts in education, where she focused on um, the intersection of education, policy, and research, and emerging technologies, and, the, and um, the, the needs of teachers, students, and managers. So, the title of uh, Karen's talk is transforming American education, learning powered by technology. So I'm really looking, looking forward to this talk and it's over to you, Karen, if you're ready. Thank you very much. So first audio check, can you all hear me? Yes. Wave, say hi if you can. Very good, love that. Love it when technology works. Nice to see all of you. And thank you uh, one and all for your uh, uh, patience and understanding and uh, uh, flexibility with uh, presenting from uh, this lovely Hampton Inn in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I called, asked what color the picture would be on the wall so I could match my shirt to the picture and, and such. And, um, but really, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, very happy that you allowed me to continue uh, and, and chat with you uh, from abroad. Um, really uh, interested in the work that you all are doing and your conference. It's very aligned with many of the things that we're thinking about as well around innovation, around evidence and data, around personalization, uh, the kinds of things you've been, you've been talking about. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend about you know, 20, 30 minutes just going through some, some things on slides and then uh, hopefully we will have the most of this time for, and it's actually great, I, I can see See, I don't know if you see what I see, but I can see all of you kind of in the audience. It's panning back and forth. So um, again, really happy to, uh, to see you all. So I'm going to go ahead and um, be uh, kind of moving through these slides. So I, I do know it, it says transforming American education here on, on the slide. And, um, but what I've, what I've definitely learned over the last uh, two years that I've been I've learned lots and lots of things in the two years that I've been in, in government. And actually, let me digress for just a second. It's funny when people look at bios, they, they get a little tired after the second line, which I don't blame anybody. But um, I'm going to shorten my bio to basically be three things. And that is two years of government right now. Prior to that, um, 12 years in corporate life at Apple. And prior to that, which is usually what people don't get to, uh, 17 years in public education. So kind of have that, uh, the feel for the ground uh, in the classroom, in, in uh, actual uh, real schools, and try to carry that with me through my work. Um, the other thing I've learned uh, here in government is that, um, you know, when, when the White House picks a date or, or announces something or says what's happening, uh, there is not flexibility around that, and, and we uh, go with the flow. So, so again, that's, uh, that's why I'm not actually with you uh, in person. So, um, but the other thing I've learned is that, that all of this, everything we're talking about, wherever I travel, whether it be throughout the, the United States or abroad in, in other countries, I definitely hear the same themes, the same things that people are talking about, and it definitely gives this sense that we can, working together kind of raise all. What I wanted to talk about were kind of three things. One is, why is this education internet moment? Which is what we've been telling everybody, this is education's internet moment. So investors, start investing, entrepreneurs, dust off your very best ideas, researchers, publish, create, uh, design, um, and, uh, and teachers, students, um, everybody kind of uh, hold on to your hats, as they say. The second thing I'm going to give you just a, a various, very highest level overview of the National Ed Tech Plan that we published in the United States um, with hopes that it's, it's helpful other places. But then I really want to tell you kind of some of the things that we're actually uh, doing and trying to accomplish um, that we would like to, in fact, accomplish with the rest of the world. So first of all, this is a little bit of a digression, a little bit of uh, US uh, popular culture. But every February, we have the Super Bowl. And for those who, of us, you know, millions of people who are actually not football fans, but end up with the Super Bowl 
streaming into our living rooms. We watch it for the commercials. For about the past, oh, I don't know, 25 years or so, the commercials have actually been the, the most interesting part. And there are, con super, there are Super Bowl commercial contests, et cetera, et cetera. So for those of you who know about the Super Bowl commercials, um, I'll give you a sense of, of uh, kind of what happened this year. This year was kind of a transition point, an inflection point with Super Bowl commercials. And I promise I will tie it back to education. What, what people do when they, get, when they play a, a Super Bowl commercial, they spend $30 million for their 30 seconds to play sometime during the Super Bowl, knowing that many people during the commercials will actually not be looking at the TV, but they'll be wandering off to get something to eat or whatever. There are about 100 million people who watch the Super Bowl. But this year, they ended up dubbing it the Transmedia Bowl, because this is what happened this year. People looked at this as a multimedia opportunity, a multi-channel opportunity. And believe it or not, these people who create commercials for products talked about it as a deeply social experience. So what happened was they had, they had their 30-second commercials, but their entire design was focused on how they get attention prior to the, to the Super Bowl, after the Super Bowl, and, and how they can turn their 30 seconds into many, many uh, more seconds and, and minutes and, and hours, and how they can leverage the, the, all of the social media sites to get more eyes on their product, on their commercials. And actually, it was quite successful this year. So for example, every year, um, there is a, a chip maker, maker company, uh, Doritos, who has a Super Bowl commercial contest. And they allow people, they crowdsource the commercial, and then they vote on them, and then they play the winner on the Super Bowl. This particular commercial is one that was created by a, a, a gentleman who spent about $500 making this commercial, as opposed to the $3 million that, uh, that companies spend, and ended up having a, 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 a great commercial that was quite popular, and people watched over and over and over again watching the, uh, the action. This was a commercial for Rio, the movie, the feature-length film Rio de Janeiro. And for, uh, for those of you who might play Angry Birds, are there any of you in the audience who play Angry Birds? Just now I can see if you're actually still, uh, yeah, there you go. I can see that you can at least hear me again. Uh, for those of you who play Angry Birds, the, the key to this commercial was you stopped the commercial partway through, and you had to find, you had to freeze frame it to find the secret code to a special level of Angry Birds so that you could log that level of Angry Birds into your phone. And then you were actually entered into a drawing uh, to attend the, the, uh, the premiere uh, in Rio de Janeiro. So on this screen, you can see hiding in the background are two little Angry Birds. And they are, in fact, uh, holding a secret code for, the, uh, for, the, for, for folks. So here they turn their 30 seconds into, I don't know how long it would take people to freeze frame through the 30 seconds to actually find the secret code, and then on and on and on. And then finally, the, this one was an, a commercial with this adorable uh, young uh, Darth Vader uh, trying to, um, to do things to the dog, to the washing machine, to lots of things around the house. And finally, the punchline is the, the father starts the car remotely from inside of the house, and the, the child is convinced that, that he actually started the car with his force. So what was interesting about this one is the online version of this commercial was not 30 seconds. It was, it was 90 seconds. And when you, played, but when you saw it on the TV screen, you would be like telling everybody, come watch this. It's really cute, et cetera. And they played it for, for weeks ahead of time. Um, so they had many, many more eyes than were actually on the, on the commercial. So all of this is, is interesting, right? But it's, but it's, and it, it's fun. But what I think it is, it's very instructive. And I think that if, if the companies that are creating commercials can figure out how to increase and improve engagement, I think that there are some things that we can also learn. So another interesting thing is, um, there are webcams all over the world, as you know. And this year, there were these baby eagles that were in a tree high above the, uh, the, the, a, a place in Iowa, Decorah, Iowa. And these birds, these little baby eagles, got more attention online than, than most, uh, most popular websites. And what was interesting about this is when you think about it, it was an entire 
uh, science, uh, science lesson, science experiment over several months where the, the, the parent eagles, the mother laid the eggs, we watched them, they hatched, these little babies grew to, from these little tiny eagles to large eagles in a very short amount of time, several, a couple months, um, and then you could watch them fly away. And uh, the kinds of things that you can do with technology that you cannot do without technology um, are astounding. And this is, a, this is a perfect example of one of those kinds of things. And then one last example, kind of just to, to pull from outside of, of uh, traditional education, is when the earthquake and ensuing tsunami hit Japan, all of us were suddenly placed right in the middle of the tragedy that was happening on the spot because so many people had flip cameras, they had phone cameras, they had cameras in their pockets, and they could, in fact, uh, show the world exactly what they were feeling, what they were, what they were seeing on the spot. We saw so much footage, including the joyful footage when, when this rescuer found this baby um, a few days later uh, 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 fully uh, alive and, and, um, and well. And these are the kinds of things, again, that we can build this, this much more improved and increased uh, global understanding. So these are some of the background kinds of things that we think about and the kinds of things we think about when we created and launched the National Education Technology Plan. We said there's so much happening outside of education that is instructive. We're, we're seeing lots of different things. We're seeing mobile, obviously. I'm sure every single one of you has the entire internet in your pocket. Um, all day, every day, right? So you carry around the internet in your pocket. It is 24-7, and many of our students and, and learners of all ages have that as well. Um, there are social interactions for learning. The places people get together online, whether they're learning to knit, or learning to cook, or learning to fix the faucet in their, in their kitchen, whatever, whatever it is, there are many places that people learn together online, the, the best possible social interactions. There's digital content improving every single day. One of the things that we, that's gotten a lot of press is this whole Khan Academy and the, um, what happened when a single individual decided to start explaining how to do math problems to his cousins. And it has become kind of, a, again, a, it has taken off as a website that people can use to learn things of all, of all different sorts. But better and better, more highly produced digital content allows us to access experts. And finally, I think the most kind of misunderstood and misused and, and the nascent uh, in education uh, um, practice will be that practice of understanding. If we think of what all of the consumer companies and, and other, other folks are doing with big data and truly personalizing the advertisements that you see on your screen, you know, all of the different things that, that people know about us from our Facebook you know, social uh, connections, LinkedIn social connections, to, um, to what we search for, what we look for. The notion of leveraging big data and understanding how to use that to fully engage and personalize uh, learning for students is something I think that in the next several years we'll see more and more of and something that we're, we're really interested in understanding. We, in education, are incredibly data poor. We don't have good data. It's very much of a, uh, you know, a manual practice. And, an, a, and I think that we can combine the best possible interactions with students and teachers with tools that will allow us to, to use uh, data and understand much more about how students are learning. So what we're talking about is this inflection point that we're at. Oh, sorry. This inflection point that we're at transitioning from a predominantly print-based classroom to a digital learning environment. And many people kind of stop and say, well, you know, do we really want to have, do we really want um, students reading their textbooks on a screen? And when we talk about digital, as you know, we're not talking about simply textbooks on a screen, but much more powered up learning environments that include visualizations and simulations. You know, it's funny, actually, it's funny, I was talking to someone this weekend, and they're saying that the uh, the uh, Harry Potter newspaper, you know, when, the, when the, uh, the, the, they, they get their newspaper and there are people that jump out and start talking with them and, and that kind of thing. I mean, we're not actually that far from having the kinds of textbooks and interactive environments, the guiding interface that is somewhat like the Harry Potter newspaper. 
it's actually interesting to think about. But other things including increased feedback loops, the opportunity to publish, the opportunity to access experts um, from, uh, from afar, um, visualizations and simulations, and all of those kinds of things that you can actually build into um, online interactive environments. We're actually interested in, in launching sort of a, a, a global you know, challenge. And can we create an interface that will, in fact, teach people to read? And as we like to say, we don't mean read badly or read with training wheels, but really teach people to read. Can we look at the best research on, on teaching reading? And, and can we create interfaces that actually uh, guide a reader and improve their ability uh, to read independently. So education's internet moment. We do think it's here. We do think we are going to see this, this transition from predominantly print to a digital learning environment. So we launched the National Education Technology Plan last November. So hopefully you've seen it. And if you haven't, you can download it. at uh, The website will be at the end. And um, uh, five sections. There are six sections to it. The first chapter is all about learning. It's about personalization. It's about reaching all learners, meaning that learners with disabilities or special needs or language learners or um, you know, uh, gifted, you know, whatever the needs are of students, we truly should be able to personalize and bring in that long tail of experience. And rather than trying to have everybody do the same thing and shutting down kind of prior experience and personal stories, how can we bring that into the learning environment and truly leverage that? The thing about the learning chapter was we focused on grounding it in basic research so that it didn't come across as number one fluffy and oh great, this will happen someday, and also didn't come across as old and tired. We really wanted to hit that sweet spot of being visionary, being out there, but grounding it in, in actually what we do know. And, and uh, that's what we, I think, accomplished with the, with the learning chapter. The teaching chapter was very much focused on how can, we, how can we augment human performance? How can we make sure that every teacher is as connected to all of the data, content, tools, resources, to each other, to their, to, to their ex, to the experts, maybe back to their college of education, to their mentors, whoever. How can we create an entirely interconnected teaching profession in order to help education professionals have the information and the help they need every single moment that they need it, rather than waiting to possibly take a class in the summer or take a class on a, on a given in-service day. We really want to power up the teaching profession. The, not that I'm a fan of military analogies, but in the military, they talk about technology as a force multiplier. And I think that that's actually an interesting term when we think about the teaching profession and thinking about technology as a force multiplier. We don't see technology replacing teachers. We see it as powering up their ability to meet the needs of every single student. The assessment chapter was all about increasing and improving feedback loops. I think probably everybody knows everything there is to know about that um, in terms of, you know, right now, again, we're, we're data poor. We want better and better information and feedback going directly to students, teachers, and parents. So if you buy that broad vision of a learning, teaching, and assessment environment that's powered up with technology, the infrastructure chapter says, OK, what do we need to have in place in order to make this happen? So the infrastructure is very much about what we call the cyber infrastructure for learning and it's about the broadband access at home at school in the community so that the school can become a node on the network of learning so the school is one place that students can learn but they take with them outside of school the materials on a on a mobile device or whatever so the the we have an infrastructure that actually supports 24 by 7. And this infrastructure also includes the people that are capable and, 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 and uh, makes it possible for this to happen. The people that can support this kind of system, that can build this kind of system. And this has required very much of, a, of an interagency effort here in the United States. So we work with our Federal Communications uh, Commission, with the Department of Commerce that has spent billions of dollars on broadband projects throughout the country. 
and our Department of Agriculture that has done the same for broadband projects that are in rural areas. So we're very focused in building out the infrastructure to support access to the opportunity to learn. And finally, the chapter on productivity was all about how can we make sure that every single student, every single learner has what they need at that point of learning. So that it isn't organized based on the calendar or based on time, but rather based on building competency, improving performance, making sure that we're keeping people kind of at their peak performance that's between frustration and boredom. Right? So how do we make sure that we're, act we're actually leveraging the best possible, uh, most efficient and effective uh, methods possible? And we think all of this, increasing data, increasing connections, improving access, making sure that people have what they need when they need it, we think all of thing these things actually will vastly improve the productivity of our education system. And when we talk about education system, we're talking about learners of all ages. So that in, in, is, the, is the National Education Technology Plan in the US, much like what I've heard people across the world thinking about. And then we had this bonus section that we called the grand challenges, the research and development, and, and focused on, on what needs to be invented. Where are the places that we really do need intensive R&D in order to make this uh, plan actually uh, come to fruition. So education's internet moment, the National Education Technology Plan, and now let's give you a quick sense of some of the ways that we're thinking about this space. You know, kind of call it an ecosystem for learning technologies. So there's kind of three quick things. Talking about basic research, and I have been alluding to basic research. Talking about then taking that basic research and developing products and services and the kinds of things that actually will take it from the, the laboratory into an actual development phase with, of course, multiple feedback loops. And then to implementation. What happens when it reaches the classroom? And can we get better and better evidence um, uh, about uh, what's happening uh, in our, in, when these products are actually put to work for the purposes of learning? So this is an eye chart, and I'm not going to expect you to read it, but I put it in here just so that when people think about basic research, they say, so what, is, what exactly are we referring to? We're referring to all of the things happening, and I know many of you in the audience are also focused on different kinds of things, that different research questions that you're, that you're working on. Um, one of the things that we're really interested in is can we build a transparency uh, layer? Can we make it much more understandable to many more people um, the kinds of things that people are focused on in basic research. So when we think about how do people learn, what is the role of feedback, can we build algorithms, what are the algorithms that give us better information from data that we, have, that we, that we see, what are the best ways of finding things and sharing things and producing things, can we create systems for problem solving, can we create cognitive tutors, what does a cognitive tutor look like? How do people learn when they're sitting next to a, a, an adult? Um, what, is, what are the ways that, that we see people learning to read? And what is the role of the, the person? And what's, what kinds of things could, in fact, be potentially uh, created in an online environment? So all of the kinds of things that we see happening in basic research, we're incredibly interested in making transparent and then connecting that to the people who make products and services so they can ground the things that they're doing in basic research rather than having kind of a, a interesting idea because they went to school one time. You know, there are, there are all different kinds of, of products and services being designed and developed at this moment. Some of them um, inventive and innovative and some of them kind of automating uh, old practices and some of them just being, uh, you know, n maybe not that helpful. So these are the kinds of things that we're, we're thinking about in the basic research, how to make it incredibly transparent um, so that many more people can, uh, can, can access uh, those. So one of the reasons that I couldn't actually fly there is we are about to launch a new initiative called Digital Promise, the National Center for Research in Advanced Information and Digital Technologies. We're actually going to 
change that long name um, at some point. Um, but this will be a nonprofit organization that we are we're starting it up. We have a board that was uh, selected with the help of our Congress. Um, this will be kind of this new national center for focusing on learning technologies and the kinds of things from the making basic, mapping out basic research to focusing on the marketplace, the demand side, making uh, the opportunity to interact with people who actually use products much more possible for for startups and, and small companies and all the way to big on the on the uh, so on the demand side we want to we want to create a smarter consumer schools have been primarily focused on buying uh, textbooks and maybe some supplemental materials but what we want to do as we flip to digital is create a much more um, intelligent demand cycle so that people know what they actually are uh, are, are looking at and have a sense of how to tell whether it, it should it has evidence that it would be um, something that would help their students learn. Same thing then on the supply side, making the supply side better. So focusing on basic research, making sure supply and demand in the marketplace are um, improving uh, day by day. And then finally on the implementation side, uh, making sure we're we're connecting into uh, to the implementation layer. So the implementation layer is very much about evaluation and use. We want to learn, the, learn from the very best possible schools we can learn from. We want to build uh, uh, a, a much broader base of evidence. One of the things that we talk about in education is, again, we're data poor. We don't have much evidence. When we do, have, uh, w when we do try to get evidence, many times it's connected to a highly rigorous scientific study that needs to strip out implementation and context. And what we want to do is bring those things back in. So we're very focused on building kind of a new framework, a new way of thinking about the gathering of evidence. And again, to, to raise all boats to help everybody understand much more about what works. We're also focusing on uh, building competency-based practices rather than seat time. And you probably also have been thinking about and working on the whole notion of badging or badges. You know, that comes from the, uh, the gaming world, leveling up and, and earning badges, which are of a competency-based system. And finally, we're building this whole, this whole area of online communities of, oops, sorry. <laughs> online communities of practice that will um, in fact, improve the exchange of, of information, technical support, emotional support, social support, um, build role models, build, um, again, people can earn you know, badges by producing more, publishing more, supporting other people, um, observing, sharing, collaborating, and then co-developing. One of the interesting things we've been thinking about in the community is a practice space is a notion of a persistent profile that you could take with you from the very first part of your education experience all the way through. And as you go, you're adding uh, competency, you're adding um, badges, you're, you're adding to this. And so if you all meet each other at a conference and you quote unquote professionally friend each other, right? You could see each other's professional profile. You can see the places that they are uh, connected, where they, you know, what they're thinking about, where they've published, what communities they're part of, um, and so on, and build this kind of notion of a persistent profile that stays with somebody over time. There's, there are a lot of things that are, are close to that now, um, so this isn't like a, a giant, you know, far-reaching novel idea, but it is one of the things we've been thinking about in terms of how to power up the teaching profession and better connect people to what they need. So finally, our president has, has absolutely focused on education um, as, a, as a moral obligation, as a, an economic imperative. Um, and we have support at all levels, uh, bipartisan, for creating the best possible learning environment for every student in the country. And that is what gets us up in the morning and keeps us awake at night and, and we're, really anxious to learn with people throughout 
the world about how to actually uh, see this, this big vision uh, come to fruition. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and we have about you know, 25 minutes for uh, interaction and questions. Thank you. That was great, Karen. Thanks very much for that. Um, so um, what we're going to do now is um, just to remind everyone, the, the PowerPoint slides are in Crowdvine. They're in there twice. We do it in duplicate in alt. And um, uh, the, the, if there's a bit of a time lag when you ask questions. So just uh, pause, colleagues, in between uh, the interactions between questions just to, for it to make sense and get through to the other side of the Atlantic. Um, and don't forget, uh, colleagues, if you this, this is uh, Well, I've switched it on. I mean, uh, beyond that, I can't really... Uh, do you, have you got a roving mic you can give me? A roving mic? Yeah. Is it on? All right, thank you. No, it was behind me. Yeah. It was behind me, Karen. Uh, sorry, just to say, um, so there's a bit of a time lag when you're asking questions, guys. Um, uh, say who you are. Um, and just to say, we, we here at the Association for Learning Technology, we particularly found your uh, talk fascinating. We're glad you came in uh, because we've been in, in dialogue with uh, Business in Innovation and Skills Government Department about evidence-seeking questions. We've been with it. I'm the chair of the research committee for Alt, and we've uh, sent things over there, and we've got ongoing dialogue there. We've been in dialogue with. Michael Gove about um, the, the the consultation about the national curriculum, and um, that's uh, we've we're, there's there's a, a, a report going on, on that and con and dialogue going on on. Uh, we'll we'll certainly report uh, back to the government uh, departments if they listen uh, to to what you're doing uh, and your excellent work. So I'm gonna now and don't forget colleagues, colleagues there's, there's questions coming in externally which Matt is gonna I'll go to Matt at some point to try and get some indication of what's going on though. So. First of all, I'm going to turn my back on you, excuse me, Karen, to look for questions. Anybody got any questions? Uh, I can see one up there, so if we go there. And can you start, start putting, your, putting your hands up so that I can get the other mic on? So there's one up there, Nigel. Uh, anyone else? Well, let's get ready. Hi, Karen. My name's Nigel Ecclesfield. I work for the Learning and Skills Improvement Service here in England. So we're a, a, a public agency working for government around improvement in further education. Two very short points, one of which I was very taken by your term levering, leveraging big data. And like a lot of colleagues, I'm concerned with the process of changing data and information into knowledge, to quote Richard, Richard Noss here in the UK. So I'd like your, your comments on how you see those mechanisms are going to be put in place not to just store the data, but to make, turn it into useful knowledge. And the second one was later on, you talked about making people better consumers of the technology. I'd like to pick up a term from a colleague in the US, Caroline Haythornthwaite, about learning for production as well as consumption. Um, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that. So thanks for the, the presentation, and it's just those two points. Certainly. Um, and just again, somebody stop me if you can't hear me, I assume you can. Um, yeah, so first of all, the, the turning data into information is, in, is, is kind of the holy grail, because we can have lots of data. In fact, I talk to companies that say they have so much data that they've been collecting for years, a company data about what time students you know, interact and you know, when they seem to be um, doing better or whatever. There's so much data. But we have no idea really what to do with it. So part of it, as I've been talking to people, is trying to marry psychometricians with computer scientists. So where the computer scientists go, they're going to the consumer companies. They're going to the places where their skills at creating algorithms and turning information or turning data into information are actually highly valued. And so trying to figure out how computer scientists can actually begin to leverage uh, and understand the kinds of data and then begin to turn it into something that's inf interesting for folks. That's one thing. The second thing is I think that we can, we're, we're thinking through how to create, put data sets online and make them transparent. So that's, this is at a, a, a whole different level, but if we can in fact anonymize 
and aggregate data so that we protect privacy, are there ways that we can put big data sets online so that we can crowdsource uh, interesting applications of that data, interesting visualizations of that data, interesting mashups between data sets, uh, and the like. So that's the second thing. But the third thing I think is actually the most sort of interesting um, as we go forward, and that's the notion of creating electronic learning records. Um, and, I, and I apologize for not knowing, I believe that Europe in general, I know Germany, for example, is well ahead of the US in terms of, and I don't mean this as a competition, I just mean as more evolved, in terms of um, health records that, that travel with the person, right? So health records that travel with the person mean that if you get in an accident or if you, are, if, if you go to the doctor or whatever, you have your, the doctor that's going to help you or to the, the radiologist or to whoever you need to see. If we think about electronic learning records, it's the same thing except for the learning data travels with the student. So if we did something like that and if students took, for example, a big test that is sent off and scored elsewhere, if we had as a requirement when they send that data back, it's not just back to the school district, but it's also back and the requirement to deposit the learner's data into their personal electronic learning record. These kinds of things will bring the data and information much closer to the student so that the student, when they have a teacher, change schools, have an after summer parents, whoever is helping them, they have the information with them. Instead of saying, here's what I got to do today, here's what I don't get, very paper-based, and the, and the person trying to help them has no idea kind of what's come before or what will come after. So that's, excuse me, that's, that's another kind of notion. So we're thinking about this notion of electronic learning records, and there are some big companies that are working on this problem. We have, I'll say one more thing about this, we have data sets that um, the school, there's sort of this top-down notion that the school has, the, the school district has data and sometimes they even talk about giving it back to the teachers and it's like, or giving it to the teachers and it was like, well, the data originated in the classroom. Why is our data so far away from the learning moment is, is another part of the question, part of the, uh, the big question uh, to answer. So, so I, there's, there's lots and lots of things about the use of we need to leverage transparency and we need to get the data much closer to the learning the, to the learning moment um, uh, as, a, as a couple examples. In terms of um, you know, uh, learning for, um, for consumption or learning for production, absolutely. I mean, we know so much about engagement and what engages people is when they're actually doing something, they're leaning forward, they're interacting, um, they're producing something, they're adding their own value, they're telling their own stories. Um, and we have example of that after maybe disengaged from school, but they go home and they're interacting, producing, con uh, publishing um, uh, on, online and in other places. And producing isn't just about publishing, it's also about producing new ideas, producing, um, being engaged in solving complex problems. Uh, lots of really interesting things you can do when you can get students, again, out of the kind of industrial model and into a much more productive and engaging and interesting and powered up learning environment. Uh, that was a long answer. That was a great I'll answer. I think this sure. is working now. Um, um, th that's, thanks, Karen. That's an excellent answer. We've got a question from our keynote from yesterday. Uh, Miguel Breckner. Would, uh, over to you, Miguel. Hi, Karen. Uh, my name is Miguel Breckner. I run the program uh, Seibal in Uruguay. It's the program by which we've given a laptop to every child and every school child and every teacher in the country. You were talking about personalization and talking about the infrastructure. Do you have any plans on getting to every student with either a laptop or a tablet or being able to work together so that the teacher knows what's happening with him and he can get directly access to all the digital information? Absolutely. So first of all, I want to absolutely congratulate you. Um, I was actually talking with the Secretary of Education um, last weekend, uh, Arnie Duncan, and telling him about your country, about um, what South Korea has announced by 2014. And he was incredibly interested in 
and uh, what you have done. You really have been, you are stepping out as a leader across the world. So first of all, thank you very much. I think you're, you're showing uh, kind of what's possible and, and you're, you're, uh, you're powering up learning for every single student. Um, what, what we're, so we're very interested. And we're also interested in what you're finding, what the practice is, how long it takes to, to actually transition. Um, in the United States, we have, we are kind of, like 50 little countries when it comes to education. So there are states that are looking at saying by 2014 or whatever, we will, we will in fact um, be like, like uh, Uruguay, like, like, uh, like uh, and provide every a laptop. So we definitely are, are very interested in, in following your work. Um, and uh, many people in the country are also saying, hey, we should be leaders, we should lead this, we should also lead this effort. So as we go, we definitely want to uh, learn from you and, um, and uh, follow in, in your footsteps. The, the personalization part of it is not a given. As I travel and visit classrooms where all students have devices of any kind, many classrooms are still in lockstep having every student do the same thing at the same time, stay on the same screen. Um, it's, it, it's a habit and a practice that's going to be incredibly hard to break. I think one of the things that we need are better products. We need better, better content, better interactive environments, better interfaces that guide the learner and take them where, where they are, rather than uh, in the previous, the previous question, rather than thinking about the learner as a consumer and providing them the information to consume. Sorry. One last thing I'll say, one of the things that we're really interested in, in an online website where people can work together on this, but creating more and more compelling assignments for students. Not fluffy projects, not cute assignments, but really come deep uh, assignments that, that engage them, that get students working together, that's very participatory, that allows them to access experts, that allows them to, to, to think deeply about things and bring their particular kind of angle or expertise uh, to, to potentially solve complex problems. So this notion of creating more compelling assignments, that is something that I think we can engage all educators in doing so that they aren't kind of snapping back to their the, what's comfortable, and that is controlling and managing and making sure that every student is kind of staying with them. So again, thank you for, for, uh, for the leadership that you're showing across the world. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Karen. Uh, we've, although we've been experiencing some uh, difficulties, particularly for uh, remote uh, colleagues, uh, we have got some questions that which um, Matt uh, Lingard is now going to uh, pose one of them for us to you, uh, uh, Karen. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, Karen. It's Matt here. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, for me, quite a strong theme at the conference so far has been collaboration. And we've had a question online from uh, Jack82. I'm not sure who that is. But he's interested to find out the level of collaboration between institutions in the States. It's all over the map. On a continuum, I kind of, I kind of uh, you know, I think of things sort of where are we along a continuum and as a system and then as, a, as, a, as, a, as an institution and then as individuals. And I see individuals that are fully collaborative and fully interactive working with each other. Um, I see institutions that have put practices in place to connect the work happening in their institution with um, other institutions. And I, and I, and I see... Uh, uh, kind of a growing um, understanding about the need to in collaborate fully. One of the things that we know in every other industry is that it takes kind of complex teams to solve complex problems. So we are in education, again, trying to, to move from this kind of solitary, isolated practice to building teams. The work on, on uh, communities of practice and uh, persistent profiles and connecting communities of practice with each other, um, those, that is really important. So there's sort of some technical, technical uh, um, 
solutions. Another sort of technical solution for those of you who are techies in the audience is something called a learning registry that my colleague Steve Midgley has been leading. You can look at it at learningregistry.org if you're interested. That's a technical solution that will help us better connect um, the, um, the environments, the content, and the conversations and the collaborations in one place with those who are complementary in another place. Um, another thing that we're really looking at is this notion of uh, what we call regional innovation clusters. So trying to figure out how within a region, so say um, you know where I am today, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Carnegie Mellon is here, lots of intensive R&D research happening here, trying to figure out how to connect that regionally, so in the same area, with innovators and, and uh, entrepreneurs and investors, right? So you make, we're trying to m meld that, make that connection, and then also connect them with some of the cutting edge and leading edge schools in the area so that they have places to interact uh, directly. So building collaborations at every level, transparency of basic research so that people can see who else is working on what they're working on, connections between um, the different levels within the kind of uh, ecosystem and the, the research and development chain, and then uh, connecting individual practitioners uh, with each other and with groups. That's great, Karen. Uh, we've got time for, I think, for at least two more questions. So we've got one here for Bob. Introduce yourself. Hi, Karen. Uh, my name is Bob Harrison. I run a community of practice called the Toshiba Ambassadors. Uh, we, we met before at Graham Brown Martins gig in London last year. I spent some time in the summer with Larry Cuban and I was interested to read the New York Times article at the weekend. Uh, you're shaking your head now because you know there's a question coming. What, 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 why is it that there's at best a flat lining of test scores in all those states that have invested heavily in uh, technology? We, we are particularly interested over here because our Secretary of State is driven by the PISA tables. So what, what's the relationship between investment in technology and scores in international and, in fact, localized tests? So the answer is we don't know. One, why I was shaking my head about the New York Times article is I think that it dusted off a lot of old ideas, including Larry Cuban's ideas about evidence and statistics. Um, it dusted off a single school district and found kind of the worst examples of practice. It sprinkled technologies throughout the article with all kind of equal levels of, of uh, clarity. So it sprinkled, you know, interactive boards and, and laptops and um, basic skills software and uh, PowerPoint. I mean, it was just kind of this it was an interesting article and he told a story but his storyline was the same storyline that we've been hearing that we've been hearing for a long time and it's the storyline that makes me rather crazy at the moment because here's the thing when we ask the question does technology work or should we buy technology the answer is it depends right obviously asking that question is kind of like saying does a school work does a library work? Does a book work? And the answer is, it depends. It depends on what's inside. It depends on the interactions. It depends on how the thing is designed. It depends on who's supporting it. It depends on so many things. And so to bring back, dredge up this question about does technology work is a crazy question. So if you say, if you, so we need to, we need to Im improve, we need to ratchet up the intelligence of the conversation by asking questions like, so, so if, I, if you break it down, it's like it depends. And then you can say, let's see, does a word processor, Mr. Journalist, help you do your writing or do you write manually? Would you like all of our students to continue to learn to write manually? Will that in fact help their ability to write competently going forward into the future, right? Would you like students to continue going to the library and writing their research papers out of an encyclopedia? Or would you, in fact, like them to begin to build inquiry skills, to build uh, questioning strategies, and to understand how to, how to work with the vast wealth of research and information on the internet? So this question of does technology work and should we spend money on technology is just a, just a 
a crazy question. So my particular quote in there were probably about four hours in total. Um, and I had a single sentence that I'm sure he couldn't wait to publish. And it, I said something about, you know, that the current tests we have, this once a year single test, single um, point in time, um, that is not given, that is completely inadequate for understanding the kinds of complex interactions between students and information, students and each other, students and collaborative environments, all of those kinds of things. It's, it's inadequate. So that's what I was pointing out. So then he's, I, you know, you can tell I get passionate and I talk about these things, but I didn't, I didn't actually, I don't know if I said it or not in the context of the conversation, I said something about if test scores remain flat in the beginning of an intervention, that that actually is not a, a horrible thing, it, because there are all of these other kinds of things that are also taking place. The, the, the test does not test whether they can ask good questions or research on the internet or collaborate effectively or communicate with other people. The tests are completely inadequate for, for measuring what we need to know about the, the most important things that students need to know and be able to do going forward. Now that said, I fully believe that technologies also can help students do better at basic mathematics and computation. I think that's math that technology can do better at helping students become better readers and, and more effective interpreters of information as they read. Um, so I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't you know, use, but we need better, we need much better assessment uh, instruments. Again, the data getting much closer to the, to the, to the learner. And then the one thing, uh, one other thing since you brought up Larry Cuban, the one thing that, that I'd love to ask him, and I should do so, I should call him, the one thing that there's not a name for, but if you think about it, there's no way of testing what would have happened had we not done this intervention. You can't go back and have a control group. Right? So if you do a, a big intervention, there's not a way of going back and, and testing and seeing uh, you know, what would have happened otherwise. Big case in point, if you think about the, the giant you know, global financial crisis that we're in right now, we can't go back and see what would have happened had we not invested heavily in, in some of the things we invested in a, a few years ago. They are just, it, it's, a, it's part of the, the, the kind of evidence conversation that falls flat. So, Larry Cuban is very interested in evidence and, and, um, and specific data. Not opposed to that, but we need much more intelligent uh, data and we need much better questions. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> that was, that, um, we had some passion yesterday from Miguel. Now we've got some real passion here. I, I love it. Uh, and if, if, if uh, we've been, as I say, the have been involved in the debate with, with uh, evidence-seeking questions from the government's department, BIS, and we were, we were quote, quoting in particular Seymour Papart on his take on all those things. It's a, and go read it, guys. It's a great read. We, we have uh, time to probably have one question, which we, uh, have you got the microphone over there? Did you put your hand up? Uh, there we are. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Oh, hello there. Um, my name's Jan Shaler. I work at the University of Chester. I also have a couple of teenagers uh, who just started back to school here. Um, and what I, my worry is that I think our education system, our school education system, is further on than yours, and that we have got a more innovative use of computers uh, in the schools. But I do worry about the homework that some kids bring home. And what if they don't have um, resources at home to support that? Have you been thinking about that and how it might be addressed? That is probably the key thing that I and my colleagues at the Department of Education are thinking about right now, and that's this whole equity question. How do we make sure, as we move to a digital learning environment, that we're building equity and supporting those students who otherwise don't have it at home? Part of my issue with that previous question and the, and the story in the New York Times also, it did not even touch that. So for rich people, and I, rich as in people who have technology at home and they know their students will, will use this, those are many of the people who are like, when my students go to school, I want them to simply not have technology. I want, that to, I want you to turn off their screen time at school. Right? So that when they come home, that's when they can get their screen time. This question of equity is gigantic and it is probably the most important thing that we need to solve because we do know that the opportunity to learn, the opportunity to learn if you're in a very rural remote space, if you're in a city and you don't necessarily have access to all of the, 
the, the resources that somebody else might have if you're in a, in a poor community. Those are the places that we need to power up in order to improve the opportunity to learn. So we're looking at lots of things. We're working with the FCC about the broadband adoption uh, rates. We're identifying those places in the country that there, is, there may be broadband access, but there's not adoption. We're trying to figure out all of the ways to ratchet up the, the literacy of the adults in the situation so that they have a sense of why would I want to be connected. Um, things like access to health information, access to government services, the opportunity to have a voice and fully participate in a growing online environment. These are all things that we see as incredibly important and things that we're, that we're working on. We're actually um, interested in one of, the, one of the things that's happened in this country, uh, Comcast and NBC merged. And as a result of that, part of the agreement was that they would provide uh, low cost. And in the United States, the low cost is $9.95 per month for broadband access at home. So those students who qualify based on their uh, economic metrics, qualify for free lunch, can now, and they're in the Comcast footprint, they will be able to access broadband um, at home. But what you point out is incredibly important. We have increasing conversation about the inverted classroom where students go home and they're doing the, the, um, the, home, the, the, the problem sets and the, they're learning the things with the, the, the teacher online and then they come to school and at school is where they interact with the other people, they get help from their teacher um, and it's, it's much more personalized. You probably have read about this, the Khan Academy and those kinds of things are, are these, they're starting these examples of inverted classrooms. As we get to an inverted classroom, we have to make absolutely sure that every one of those students has full access at home and that we're not making them go find it in a community center, go find it at a library, stay after school. But in fact, we're making sure that it's in that student's backpack as well as uh, all of the other students. One last thing. We also think that there are practices that we can leverage the kinds of things that students already have at home. So if parents have already purchased or are willing to purchase something for one student, it makes the system, right? So the system can then purchase the kinds of things for the students who otherwise don't have access. So we're trying to leverage um, kind of a, you know, an all hands on deck strategy. Some of the, the, the devices Parents might purchase some, the school might purchase some from philanthropy, some from businesses, whatever. So we're trying to figure out the practices so that community by community by community, they can make sure that they're focused on equity so it's not just those students who, who have the benefits of the best opportunities to learn with new digital tools. Okay, um, Karen, that was perfect timing, uh, great presentation, and uh, excellent dialogue. I've really enjoyed it, and I think my colleagues have, an, and I'll say goodbye to you, and we'll thank you in the traditional manner, I think, send you off on your way. Thank you very much.